I am going, uh, I believe that uh, Joseph, uh, Joe Churchwell is not going to speak, but going to introduce uh, uh, the folks that are testifying, but I'm going to, uh, Joe, I'm going to go to you.
who wanted to live by it and raise our family by it. I had learned organic gardening, and I found out that the way to have my best diet for my children was to have an organic garden. But they said you couldn't have one on the mountain we live on. But with tons and tons and tons of compost, we developed an organic garden. Why? So we wouldn't have to use commercial chemical fertilizers. Back when I was a boy in the cotton fields of South Carolina, we used tons and tons of chemical fertilizers. But I found that wasn't good for the human system. So we started a, an organic garden, and it worked. It worked beautifully well. And if you come to our website, we'll show you many pictures of how well it worked. But then there was something missing there. We learned the, the wonder of raising uh, vegetables and rocks called hydrogen hydroponics. You just put rocks in beds, you don't put any dirt, it's full of water, and you got a siphon system and the water comes in and it gets to a certain point and it siphons out, it sucks the oxygen down into that, those rocks and it feeds the plants. The plant, plants get happy they give off stuff that feeds other things. But we're raising this, but I said, wait a minute, this is wonderful vegetables of a hydroponic garden. But there's one thing we had to put chemicals into the water to feed the plants. And because we wanted our family to be as pure chemically as we could, we went to acuponics. And acuponics, and I'm Greek, acuponics is when you put fish into the water and the fish produce fish emulsion, if you will, and that goes throughout the system and you do away with the need of all these chemicals in there. Why did I do that? Because I wanted my family as pure as we could get it. I did not want to give anything to them that would hurt them. We raised a family. We wanted a family that would be healthy. We didn't inoculate our families. None of my children have been vaccinated. None of them have been vaccinated. Why? Because I've done extensive research on that. And you can disagree with me, and that's fine. But we're living for, for 20 years. 20 years, not one of these children ever went to a doctor with sickness. Now, they can say today, well, we denied the medical care. That's not true. After they were taken, they were given every kind of test they could give them, and they were all perfectly healthy. I want you to know that God showed us a system that works without sick children. We wanted our children to have the best education. We didn't withdraw from them public school because we don't like the public. My whole life has been devoted to delivering the gospel of the Lord Jesus to the public. I love people. But I wanted my children to have the very best education you could give them. And if you go into my house today and go into any room in my house just about and the thing that will jump out immediately are books, books, books. And we have 15 computers in our house. We wanted to have the best family we could and honor the Lord Jesus Christ in it the best we could. And we lived in the public. It was hardly a day went by there wasn't somebody in our community going in and out of our house. We are not kooks. We've been hiding out on the mountain trying to get ready for the end time. We've lived openly, publicly, active in the Tea Party and other places. We've been out there so people know us. Well, on January the 12th this year, we're going to have some folks over. We knew them, but not that well. But we were having them for dinner guests. They were to come at 5 o'clock. And my wife is a Cajun, and she can cook like a Cajun. If you haven't had good Cajun food, cook by a Cajun you haven't. <laughs> you need to. You see, but cooking gumbo for Cajun is a day-long affair. You smell the onions are cooking, and you smell the sausage browning, and the chicken browning, and all day this is, this is going on. My wife was making gumbo, she was cooking pies, she was cooking bread at night. It was a festive atmosphere in our home. Our children loved people. We were excited we would have guests and what we would do, we would eat together and fellowship together and then we'd have devotions together and pray together. They'd go home. We'd done that over and over and over again and that was what was happening. So there was a festive occasion and the doorbell rang about 4.30. See, the guests were supposed to come at 5. I go to the door 
and I open the door, and here's a woman throws a paper out at me, and she says something about nauseous, poisonous, nauseous substance. And I'm thinking, I'm expecting my guest. And here's this woman saying that she's serving me a warrant for poisonous, noxious substance in my house. I said, well, that's nothing you're talking about. They're coming and coming inside what we're talking about. I didn't know who she was. She had to tell you. But I didn't know her then. I said, come on in. And by the way, if you remember on the 12th, it was below freezing. It was a cold day. I said, come on in the house and, and let us talk about it. She said, no, you've got to come out on the porch. By that time, my wife came over to see what it was. Uh, if the company had come <coughs> yet. And, and uh, this lady said, come on out on the porch. We've got to talk to you here. When we stepped out on that porch, all my rights as a citizen disappeared. A man named Jason Lawrence, number two man I understand in the Sheriff's Department at that time, was in control of him, told me and my wife to sit down in two chairs on the front porch. It was very cold. My wife had been cooking and my wife was pregnant at that time. And by the way, the baby's right back there. The baby is four months old. She was pregnant with that baby at that time, and they told us to sit down there, and I said, Sir, can we go in the house? Can we call our lawyer? No. Can we go get a coat? No. And we sat in that freezing cold weather for 30 minutes to find that somebody got some coats. But we sat on that front porch for two and a half hours saying, What's happening? But when I stepped out that front door, I'm just telling you what I remember. I stepped out that door and suddenly I looked out there and my whole yard was full of vehicles. I looked up, I said, there was armed men everywhere. I found out later there was a sniper laying about 20 miles, 20 yards away from where I was sitting in the ditch. But my neighbor saw it. Guns aimed at us. I looked out there and I saw the coroner's car. I said, why is the coroner here? And I said it out loud and somebody answered, well, he has more authority than the sheriff. If I get emotional, please forgive me, but this, this is I was there. This is America. And I said, why is the coroner here? And they said, well, he's got more authority than the sheriff. Well, I said, why is the sheriff here? Why do we need the sheriff here? And I look over there, there's an ambulance. You know the big time, the ambulance or something they call it? Well, they were going to take our children one by one into that place and examine them. But more about that in a minute. But I'm, I'm looking and saying, what in the world is going on? I said, am I under arrest? Mr. Lawrence said, no. Can I leave? No. What is going on? They said, well, we're looking for MMS. I said, I, I've got MMS. I'll give it to you. Him up. My spoke. I don't want to talk about the, the, the facts of the case. I'm here just to tell you what happened. We were absolutely open, absolutely innocent. And we're asking, why is this happening? We talked for an hour and a half, two and a half hours with Mr. Jason Barnes. And all during that time, he had to know he was not talking to criminals, my wife and me. After 30 minutes, they brought us some calls. Now, after about two and a half hours, to speed things up a little bit, they let us go back into the house. But while we were sitting on the front porch, the blinds were open, and we could see what was going on in the house. And when we complained about being cold, they did offer us to take us over to a car and put us so we'd be warm. But there we could see the kids, and we could see what was going on. They wouldn't let anybody answer the telephone. And the kids were, were fine, and... We're watching them. We're watching them run back and forth. Kept going to my refrigerator. Kept going to the pantry. Kept going to the house. A long story short, that for five hours, they tore my house apart in every area. And I'm saying, what in the world is going on? Meanwhile, there's a kind man, an inspector from the DHS. And yes, as Dr. Washburn said, he has never defended the DHS so much as in my family. Because they were there watching this. And the inspector from the DHS said, there, he's a nice man. He was in my house all the five hours, and I talked to him about two and a half hours. He's a Baptist, so I, uh, we just talked, had a good time. And he kept going over. He said, I don't smell anything. There's nothing here. 
I heard him on the phone talking to his office and he kept saying things like, the kids are fine, they're healthy. You see, they took the kids one by one. Let me back up again. These kids have never been to a doctor. They've never been examined by anybody except their mother. You may be on me to some kind of external wound or something. We said, what, what's happening? And, and, and after the doctor took them one by one, and Mama was sitting right there, my wife would have been glad to go with them and there while they were being examined. They've never been to a doctor. They don't know and they respect all adults. What went on in that place alone with a stranger? You say, oh, children are very resilient. Don't use that word. Children aren't resilient. They hurt. And some of you have you have pain in your heart today because things happened to you when you were children. You know this truth. They took my little children one at a time into that thing examined. And as he came back in, this DHS inspector was sitting there watching him come in. And I heard him telling his boss on the phone or who he was talking to on his phone. He said, the children are fine. They're healthy. They're jumping all over the place. Everything's good here. And he would get up and walk around the house. You see, two of those inspectors said that after they came in the house, after a short while, they got headaches and their lips began to tingle. That was nonsense. I was sitting right there. Only thing they smelled in that kitchen was gumbo pies and bread. But anyway, and saying to that, that this DHS is a good man. I'm told not to use his name. The good man, and he's saying there's nothing wrong here. But they keep going and they keep looking. And I, kept, I saw this inspector keep going to the refrigerator like he couldn't find it. I said, What in the world are you looking at my refrigerator for? And he would go back out to, Well, you know the evidence they got. I hope you've all looked at the evidence already. What they got out of that? I, I can't talk about it. Okay, go. go. I, I would let it. To the, to okay. Your experience. Oh, okay, my experience. Okay, then so uh, this inspector was saying there's no no problem here. And he's telling everybody that there's no problem. And they're going th through the house and going to stuff. And so I'm sitting there talking with them and just assuming we're over. So just when, when it's about over, about five hours after they got there, it's now about nine o'clock or nine thirty, somewhere along there. Suddenly the door opens. And here it looked to me like a whole platoon. But it was six or eight armed officials. I don't know how to name it any other way. And other people running in and said, we're taking the children for a 72-hour hold. I didn't know what that meant. But I knew it was bad. And I stepped forward and I said, who made the decision to take my children? And I looked at Captain Finnegan and you. I looked at the next person and finally Mike Wright raised his hand and said, I need to see you know, stick by around or something. By this time our family, I'm crying, my wife is crying, the children realize something is bad. Little four-year-old Benjamin sitting in his chair and he said, Daddy, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I won't do it anymore. I want you to see something. What went on in the minds of those little kids when they were kidnapped? Not what I'm talking about. Not, not, not what went into my heart. It broke my heart. But what about my four-year-old? What about these children? Two of the girls tried to escape out the back window of the policeman standing there. These children have been taught our, our lives to, to love and respect the police. To love and respect adults. To know that daddy and mama would take care of them no matter what happened. And here, too, I'm trying to escape out of the window at the back. Mr. Stanley, I've uh, uh, given you a great deal of leeway to let you set the scene, uh, but we need to get more to the facts of the case. Okay. Okay, then, then so they, they say, okay, get two days, get two days of clothes. The children are going with us. And then, Everybody's crying. Everybody's trying to get to figure out what's going on. I didn't know what was going on. My wife, 
Nothing else, but she likes to take pictures. She got a camera and started taking pictures. And we got about 20 pictures of what went on at that time. The kids, they didn't know how to pack two days of clothes. Kids are in state testing. What's this? Okay. So, I'm not sure I understood that, but they, we got the clothes together, they got the kids, they, they're ready to take the kids out. They took the kids against our will, against the kids' will, and they took them out about 9.30, put them into sheriff cars and whatever. I was told then by uh, Tom Braswell at the DHS that they brought him to him. He received them at the back of the DHS building, and then they were under the authority of the DHS. Well, we did not see them for uh, three days, uh, four days. It was Monday night they took them, and on Friday they told them we could go see the kids. And what I want to say in that, a young lady was in charge of that strip. She was not qualified for the job she had. She was a, a kid that was raised in a family. She was very young, out of school. Uh, she never, she, she never had a spanking in her life. She could not imagine being more than one child in the family. There's not a reason, but oh, here we're going to see our children for the first time. We've not seen them since they were taken. We didn't know what had happened to them. So they told us that, that night they took them back, and after they didn't get to Lono where they kept them until like 1.30 in the morning, they had not had supper. So one time they did stop at Wendy's and give them some sandwiches. They got there and still had to be showered and be loused and get ready for their new life. And they were locked in. We could not reach them. They could not reach us. And as far as we knew, they were they, they were off limits to us. So in Friday, they'd taken us up there. But on the way, they, uh, they tell my wife and me that they had put the children into public school. <coughs> now, we have sacrificed to have homes. They told us that our son had already been sick and one of them had, had medicine already. That was on the way up there. My wife is crying most of the way, as she should be. But this long young lady gives me a form. Fill out this form that you won't talk about the case to the children. We got there in, in the low note. We went in and they put us into a, a room with a big long table full of file cabinets. Not a very commodious place to meet your children for the first time. But still we're waiting for them, and uh, they said the children weren't in the building. They would go get them. I need to go to the bathroom, so I got up and went back up where I came in to find I saw a restroom. And I walked out there, and as I walked into the foyer, I stood and stared. It was like seeing something that you, you, you know you recognize it, but it can't be real. And I'm looking, I see a, a bunch of little children sitting in some chairs right in the middle of that lobby, just sitting there. They still got their heavy coats on, remember it's January. And suddenly, Patricia, my daughter, jumped up and ran to me. I didn't recognize my own children. They're just sitting there. They see me. Recently, when we were able to talk more, and they're just getting to where they can talk about that. I said, why didn't y'all jump up and run? They said, Daddy, they told us to sit still. I talked it through them. But they came. And you know what in that meeting? The children are going to ask the question, Daddy, why is this happening? Mama, why is this happening? Remember, you can't talk about the case. Let me tell you something. That you said. For three months, they forbid us to talk about the case, my children. Every meeting we had with, with meeting them, there was at least two people there listening to every word we said. And we could not talk to them about the case. What is the case as far as the child is concerned? Daddy, why is that mean? Did I do something wrong? Did you do something wrong? Daddy, are you a crook? Did Mama a crook? Have we done something wrong? I couldn't talk to them. But everybody else could have Every, every, every meeting, there's private meetings with my children. They came to my house here all these months. They would come to our house, and my uncle got suggested this. They'd come and say, we came to talk to the children. That meant they took 
each of the seven children, one at a time, took them along anywhere in the house. They could take them anywhere they wanted to because they had access to our whole house. Anywhere they wanted to go, people we didn't know. And they sat down one by one and talked to the children and asked them questions like this. What does your mama and daddy do when you're bad? That's one of the gentle questions they ask. But they're along asking questions where we can't talk to our children about the case. But they can. And this went on month after month. The children, I know, they change my children. They change their world view. They don't see the world like they do. Will we ever be told? But I'm here today with a broken-hearted daddy that has been abused by the system. And it's not too strong to say. Because what happened the moment, and, and, and one said this to me, when I was talking, quoting my lawyer, what my lawyer said about something, they said, no, your lawyer doesn't understand this. I said, what do you mean? Joe was my lawyer then. She said, when the, in the Constitution, you're innocent until proven guilty. But when the DHS takes your child, you are guilty until the DHS proves you. And that's all we can do. And when they decided that we were innocent, our children came home. And I'm glad they're home. I appreciate uh, Senator Clark's work on this and your work. How do you work hard? And I'll tell you, this system needs to be changed. Parents are not guilty just because somebody calls up and says, your children are not properly clothed because they're running around the snow barefoot. My children want to run the snow fire, but that's their business. It's not anybody else's business. All right, they have boots on themselves. But I'll tell you, that's what we've been through. And I came to tell you something about the spirit to say, I, I need 15 hours. No, I'll quit. So change the laws. We are still, one more point, Ronald Reagan. But he said that that babe in the womb was an American citizen. With all the rights of the American citizen. I want to say something to you. My little children, from four years old to 16 years old, they are American citizens. They have rights. They are right to the front of the day. They could do what they want to do. Now, I want to tell you something else. I'm a Christian. My Christian life is for the front the Bible says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment of promise, that it might be well with you and that you might live long on the earth. That's it. Four months, my children could not obey They weren't with me. They learned to obey all kinds of things, little things in again. We were talking one time about maybe some of the children going up to visit with some friends. So Benjamin comes a day, if I go, they'll be the boss. They'll be the boss. The little fellow learned that quickly if you decide to try to find out who's the boss. He used to be the boss. He used to be mama was the boss. But now the little fellow, he got anybody bigger than the boss. Change the system. Joe, who will be up next? Dr. William Weiser, I've got a question here from yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, my question was just answered. Did you say the children were out of your home a total of four months from the time they were taken? Well, the after, um, and I'm sorry I'm not ready for the time on that, but they decided to put the kids back in the home for a six day trial after mediation. And uh, at that time, they uh, it, it started out uh, two two of the two oldest ones were not put back in custody at the end of the month. So um, uh, at the, at that time, during that six days, they were all in the home, but with constant supervision. Uh, the last being uh, a lady that was supposed to be in the house four hours a day, uh, five days a week, twenty hours a week. Uh, that was that home. Period. That was after four months we had to cut it back. 
205. I want to be sure that everybody gets to testify, and then we'll we'll allow questions. We'll bring them all up and ask questions. Whatever people have. Uh, I'm going to go to my co-chair here, uh, Representative. Hey, Mr. Chair, I'm not great to see that you, Mr. Churchwell, or Mr. Stanley, and we'll let you as the attorney make the decision who answers the question, okay? Um, when DHS presented themselves to you, Mr. Stanley, on the front porch, what credentials did they show to establish that they were with DHS? Was it just in the form of the warrant, or uh, until you stepped outside and saw the large presence of people, how were, how were they identified to you as being with DHS? No. Or I know someone. I heard someone say the DHS is not here yet. Well, we better wait for him. Okay. We, we were in the dark. All right, Miss Stanley. Let me we ask you. We weren't given the, the warrant, and we weren't given the warrant. Okay, Miss Stanley. Let me ask you. As of today, have any official charges been filed? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Churchwell, has any official charges been filed against Mr. Stanley as of today? Do you mean criminal charges? Yes. No, and uh, actually I uh, have it on good authority that the sheriff has said the case is closed. Uh, as far as he's concerned, there will be no action. So he was never, there, was, there were never ever any criminal charges in this case? I'm not aware that they ever intended any criminal charges. I'm not aware there was much of a criminal investigation. Do you know if as of today this has been, a, uh, and I cannot remember the phrase you probably don't have, a do not defend, has this been labeled as a do not oh, defend? Oh, no, we've been begging them to. I told them they need to, they know they need to, there are people within DHS that told them they need to, but when it got to the brass, uh, quote unquote, uh, we're going forward. And we're still going forward, we're set for October 9th. Okay, thank you. Sure. Representative Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the I forgot how many true findings were found. Total of 21 true findings, uh, are six, are six ne educational neglect. Okay. Okay. If, are those findings public? No. Is, well, let me take that back. They're public. I made them public. Mr. Stanley's made them public. Okay. The agency could not have made them public. Okay. So they are public. They are in the public domain. They're in a letter that I sent to of, you. Of the five most serious uh, statements of true findings, what would you consider the top five most serious charges? Burning, uh, poisoning, uh, bruising, and striking the child in the face or head. So if those are the, if the state has found your client guilty, true findings are a statement of guilt, they have found them guilty of burning, and I think the definition from the state to find that center, you have to find that be purposefully causing harm. Uh, poisoning, even though toxicology said shows no poison. Uh, striking, and the state has then turned the same kids that he found the parents guilty of, they now turn those kids back over to those parents? Yes. With no safeguards and no restrictions. Thank you. So one more question to report right now at the uh, workplace of David Mix. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're all over here on the side. Then either one can answer the question. I'm, I'm trying to find out really where the breakdown was in all of this because you mentioned. <clears throat> police and all that came out, that you actually had a good uh, conversation with the DHS investigator. So who ultimately made the decision to pull those kids out of the house? Was it the sheriff? Yes, CID investigator Michael Wright, uh, who uh, conducted, I believe, the preliminary investigation, and uh, he was the reporter. Uh, was, was there a recommendation by DHS to them? No. There was no red, so basically it was it was the he alone, that law enforcement officer alone made the decision. However, DHS has the responsibility to take the children into custody because they're the only ones that have facilities. Right, and I'm and I'm trying to educate myself. I know a lot about the, the foster care system because I'm a foster parent myself. But if DHS wanted to, could they have overridden that police officer? And, and again, if you can answer the question, maybe no. I do not believe that they can because any law enforcement agency has the authority to take a child into custody. 
and when they take the child into custody, DHS has no choice but to accept them. If I may represent the mix, that is correct. I have spent a lot of time on that, and uh, law enforcement can take uh, a 72 hour hold if the DHS wants them to or not. And then that's, that's, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, that's what I thought, but I wanted to just confirm that myself. Um, and so, and, and actually, in this case, um, the breakdown really was the sheriff and not the Department of Human Services. Is that correct? In your, in your opinion? That's our opinion. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. We, uh, we've got some more questions, but I would like to get to the next one, and we will, we will bring Mr. Stanley back. Make note of your questions. I don't want you to miss asking them. 